Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Investors Bank, the Russell Berry Foundation, Fedway Associates, Inc., New Jersey State Nurses Association, PSENG, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and banking under the principle of stewardship. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. It's my pleasure to introduce one of our distinguished academics here from NJIT, Dr. Trina Livingston Arinze, who is a professor of biomedical engineering at NJIT. And it's good to have you with us. Thank you. We were talking before uh, we actually officially got on the air. We were, you were talking about biomedical engineering. First of all, what is the field in layperson's language? It's a highly interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary field where you combine medicine and engineering together. And so you're, you're trying to solve major medical problems or conditions using engineering techniques. Um, so these can be anything from developing new therapies using kind of cutting edge biomaterials. These are materials that are implanted in the body. These the latest, greatest medical devices, um, things that interface with the brain, mm. that interface with spinal cord, um, could be new diagnostic tools, new imaging techniques. Um, that you see in the hospitals, like these MRI techniques, uh, CAT scans. So let's so do those, this. Those Assume things. you're not writing for a peer-reviewed journal for your colleagues, right? but we're communicating to the very intelligent audience on public television, but you want to do it in a way that they understand. Someone with a spinal cord injury, you and your colleagues are researching what? So we're trying to figure out ways how to rebuild or repair that spinal cord, that injured spinal cord. So. Those spinal cord injuries are a result from trauma. And once that spinal cord is actually damaged, it does not repair. You're left with a huge scar in, in that tissue. And so the axons, basically the connections that extend from the brain down into that cord and then actually connect to, to your limbs to be able to walk around mm. and move, um, that connection is lost. So, the, so we're I, trying hate to, to, I hate to do this, but for purpose of Understanding and connecting a Christopher Reeve type injury. Yeah, so it, that's you full can't fix that. That's correct. Go ahead. Yeah, so that's full paralysis. Um, so we try to rebuild that nerve tissue and make those connections again. And so we use a combination strategy, this tissue engineering strategy. Tissue engineering. Yes. So what does that we mean? just that we try to engineer the tissue uh, to rebuild. And so we we are combining these implantable materials and cells, and so the cells could be the stem cells that you hear about, and so those cells can turn into nerve tissue, ner uh, neurons, um, and so they can make those reconnections, but we use these materials, that's the engineering aspect, to actually help those, those cells become neurons. Um, so they provide the right cues to those cells to actually lay down the nerve tissue and it actually provides a, a nice surface, um, kind of a placement there, placement holder there to help rebuild the tissue and configure the tissue correctly in the, in the cord. Doctor, so where important. are we now? I know from talking to some of your colleagues in higher ed in this particular arena, I've noticed that some of us in the media, and I'll include myself, we've become very impatient. Hey, where are we now? You know, what's the outcome? When are we gonna fix it? Yeah. Research is slow. Research takes time, and there's a level of understanding that still needs to happen from the basic biological side. You know, how do these injuries occur, and what's the impact on the tissue? Because especially the spinal cord, you have this huge scar that's left over, and it's really hard to remove that um, and make those new connections. And so understanding some of that basic biology, mm. and then these new therapies can really work more effectively. If I were to say to you, how far away do you think we are from X, you won't do it, will you? I won't say that, yeah. The, we are, I mean, we're, we're you know, we're, we're definitely making progress. I think 10 years ago, we had 
very little understanding, some understanding, but certainly not the level of understanding that we have now of even how stem cells work. Right. Um, so that has progressed tremendously. Uh, and, um, e and now we have these new types of stem cells that are being created. These what I call induced pluripotent stem cells. What? Well, yeah. Induced? Where people induced pluripotent stem cells, or, or iPS cells. They didn't exist when? They did not exist five years ago. And what is the implication of the fact that they exist today? The implication is now that a patient, so any patients, you can take a person's skin cell and turn them into these iPS cells, um, these induced pluripotent stem cells. And what that means is a skin cell can now be a stem cell and has the potential to turn into, into any uh, cell type of the body. So it has this regenerative ability now, can be used to help rebuild tissues in the body. How we weren't aware of that five years ago. Question. You told me before we got on the air that you got into engineering <clears throat> because a mentor of yours, someone in, of, in your world, said, hey, you grew up in Cherry Hill? Yes. Right outside of Philadelphia. Yes. Someone said, hey, you have a proclivity for this. You would be good at this. You should do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I had that. Uh, I was fortunate to have a great uh, physics teacher in high school who said, you know what, you should consider majoring <laughs> in engineering. And I looked into it, and in college, that's what I did. So what do you do now for young men and women, <clears throat> particularly in urban areas, and particularly for women? Yeah. So I'm involved in three mentoring programs. Um, one is through the American Chemical Society. It's called Project Seeds Program. So we mentor junior and senior high school students. And these are usually underrepresented minority uh, students um, from underprivileged backgrounds, usually in the city of Newark. And they come and they work through the summer and they are involved in all the research projects that we're doing in the lab. Hands they, on? Hands on. And they're giving great presentations. They eventually move on to publish the work. And they go on and major in, you know, biomedical engineering and other types of science or engineering, uh, you know, disciplines in college. Uh, we're also involved in uh, junior high school uh, women, students. Uh, they come in and also they give them tours and... and for a couple of days in, in our lab and the department on campus so they get exposed to what biomedical engineering is all about. Um, so those are two major ones that, What's we, that like for you? we're dealing with. Um, it's a great experience, you know, just being able to give back to these students, show them that, look, there's a lot of interesting work that's being done um, that has real impact in the field and you can apply everything that you're learning in school. Um, and, and look, and there's people, you know, there's, there's students that look like you that are in the labs and you'll grow up, to, you know, and you can look like me when you <laughs> <laughs> potentially look like me. That's someone who's actually doing this type of work. You love what like you work. do. So, yeah, definitely love the work. Um, it's rewarding at the end of the day to know that, you know, the research certainly takes a while. It can be frustrating and not go in the direction that you want it to go. But no, at the end of the day, it, it does have impact. You are making some some strides there and learning what's you know going on. Keep us posted. Definitely will. Dr. Um, Trina Livingston Lorenze. Thank you very much. Professor of Biomedical Engineering at NJIT. NJIT, we appreciate you being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. Thank you very much. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, Email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org. Or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, Ph.D. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato on location for One on One. This is the 78th annual St. Patrick's Parade here in Newark, New Jersey. 78 years going strong. It's a great parade. It's a proud group of people coming together. You don't have to be Irish to march in this parade, but for 78 years they've been coming here marching. You see another group, a gr another contingent coming here marching through. You're going to get a slice of life here in the city of Newark today. Our video crew has been here. We talked to everyone who is uh, coming to participate, whether they're marching bands, whether they're here to participate. You can hear it. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear me much longer. That's why we're going to go to the videotape. You're going to love this parade, and you're going to come, want to come back here next year. Let's go to the videotape. The parade is about to kick off, and I figured what better time to uh, interrupt the Grand Marshal than right now. Patrick Dunnigan, everyone we've talked to right now is so proud, so happy to be here, and many of them are personal friends of yours, business associates. What are you feeling 
as the Grand Marshal right before we kick off. Steve, tremendous source of pride. L a little cold, too, by the way. Yeah, uh, tremendous. It's feeling a little warmer <laughs> just because the love here. Of course, of course. And everyone's Irish on St. Patrick's Day, and particularly today here in Newark. But I'm feeling extraordinarily proud. It's a great honor for me and my family and for my firm to be leading the line of march down uh, Mulberry Street here in Newark, outside the Prudential Center, past NJ Pack to the Newark Museum. It's extraordinary. And what would you say to all the folks who are, in fact, marching here in the parade? In spite of the weather, we talk about that, but the fact is, people chose to be here today. Sure. I just want to thank them all for coming out. So this is a great city, and 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 we're celebrating the life of St. Patrick through the prism of the host city, Newark, and bringing together really special people, like you said, business leaders, the community leaders, civic leaders. And you know, Steve, a lot of our friends in, in the businesses here in Newark stepped up, and we've raised over $100,000 for charity for the parade committee which they're going to dispense to 14 newark based charities here and and it's just an extraordinary event and i'm so pleased and thankful and grateful to all of those businesses for supporting the parade this year i'm here at st patrick's cathedral with mayor cory booker mayor what are you most excited to see today at the parade well i think it's just a reinvigoration of one of the great traditions in the state of new jersey uh, there used to be tens of thousands over 100,000 people used to come out for this parade as we celebrated uh, the tradition of the Irish people uh, and the Irish culture uh, here in the city of Newark. And to see it being revived, just as the city is being revived, uh, is extraordinarily exciting. And, you know, the, the history of the Irish community in Newark and New Jersey in a greater way is just uh, something that uh, I continue to be in awe of and continues to have impacts today. So, you know, this is the United States of America. and. You know, we are, our flag represents many colors, and even though you can't see it visibly, uh, our flag uh, definitely has uh, a, a green flowing through it. So it's, um, it's a tremendous day, and I'm just, I'm just really blown away by, the, uh, by this parade and how uh, our Grand Marshal and others are really making it back uh, to its old glory. Two of our greatest citizens in the city of Newark, Mary Sue and John, Today is a special day for the Irish and those of us who, you know, want to be Irish. Are you, wait, you're actually Irish? Sweeney is my maiden name. I thought you were Italian. Oh, man, <laughs> a little of that, too. <laughs> what is today, why is today so important for everyone, particularly those of us in the city of Newark? Well, I think it shows off our great city to the entire state and the world who's watching. Uh, we have so much heart, we have so much spirit and talent. And John Schreiber from the uh, family at NJ Pack. Talk about why today's important. Oh, it's just a great celebration. Proves that, proves that Newark is as vital and as, as meaningful and as diverse as ever. So it's a pleasure and a joy to be in this parade. Yeah, a special message to the Grand Marshal today, Patrick Dunnigan. We love him. One of our great board members, totally involved in the community, amazing family guy. Couldn't have picked better. I'm here with Eileen Galise, who is the Deputy Grand Marshal today for the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Newark, New Jersey. Eileen, what could we expect to see today at the parade? Well, great sunshine, lots of people out on the streets, all smiling faces. Everyone was told to wear their smile no matter what. It's going to be a fantastic day. Uh, marching bands, there's eight to ten of them from across the state. Uh, lots of young people, really enthusiastic, old and new, it'll be fantastic. How have you seen the parade change throughout the years here in Newark? Like everything else that ebbs and flows, the first parade I ever went to was down on Broad Street in downtown. And uh, my whole family came. And then it How moved, old were you then? Oh, probably about, that I remember, I was probably in my crib, but then when I was seven, I remember it. Then it moved up to Valesburg, otherwise known as the Berg in town. Uh, and, it's, and now it's back down in downtown. And it's ebbed and flowed as, as do people, but uh, it's really always been embraced. And it's really being embraced this year, especially with Gibbons and all the support they've given us. And being Deputy Grand Marshal, what does that title mean to you? It's phenomenal. It really is because you, I saw this as a little child, and this was the best day next to Christmas in our house because it was oh, so many friends, uh, people, old and new, and it, it's just such an honor because my grandparents before me and all these people that look like you, like genetically, and it, or, or they have stories. It's just a great, great day. And I'm also representing the New Jersey State Police. I'm a detective sergeant first class with the state police, and it's it's my last, well, I can probably retire this year, so it's, it's such an honor to do my heritage, my life's work, and everything all into one here. It's just great. And Essex County is always in my heart because this is where I grew up, in Irvington. What brought you out on this freezing day like this for the St. Patrick's Parade? Uh, to support the city of Newark, to support Patrick Donnegan and Gibbons, to support St. Patrick's Day. 
Well, oh, there's a connection between Patrick and Gibbons. Oh, and St. Seton Hall School of Law, right? Absolutely. Uh, Pat graduated in 1991, and we're so proud of him and all he's done for Seton Hall and for Newark and for the Gibbons firm and the people of New Jersey. So we're out here supporting him and the city, like Vicki said. I'm here with Minister Kelly from the Irish government, and you came to Newark, New Jersey today, all the way from Ireland. Why was this day important to you and to the Irish government? It was very important for us. In fact, this is the first time an Irish minister is partaking in the Newark parade. Uh, we felt it was extremely important. Um, there's a huge Irish community in Newark. Um, they do fantastic work. Uh, they promote all things Irish. And we thought it was exceptionally important to recognize that. And uh, this is the first time we're doing it, so I'm delighted to be here. You got the city's finest right here. Gentlemen, what brings you to, obviously you're all Irish. So today's, Roz, let me ask you something. You've been to a lot of parades. What makes St. Patrick's so special here in Newark? Well, it's just like any other uh, parade that we go to in the city of Newark. Uh, we are a city of diversity, of, of different nationalities. Uh, Newark was founded on, on this kind of ethnic diversity, and we're just showing uh, that we have pride in our city by supporting St. Patrick's Day and, and the parade and the Irish Americans that are here in Newark, New Jersey. Councilman, talk to us today, special day. Yeah, 78th anniversary, man. This is 78 a war, years. 78 long years. I'm proud to represent the West War, which has probably the most historical uh, numbers of Irish folks that are actually in our community. Balesburg. Balesburg branch is where I was born and raised. And so uh, my first taste of uh, Irish cuisine, uh, my first uh, <laughs> dance to any kind of Irish music happened right in my home of Balesburg. So I'm just here to, to say uh, happy St. Patrick's Day, but also to commemorate the great Irish tradition in the West War, the city of Newark. What are you feeling today? This is a special day, no? Well, I mean, this is um, what makes Newark special. I mean, we bicker over our differences, but this is a wonderful cultural tapestry of um, not African Americans, Puerto Ricans, um, you know, Irish, and um, aside from it being cold, and I, I, um, I hadn't noticed that. My intelligence tells me that we're close to a pub, so I think. Um, but but honestly, but this is a great thing about Newark it has a rich and deep tradition of um, all different heritage that come together. And as we go through these difficult times, this is what um, should bind us together: the wonderful cultural history of this great city. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a great day. Thank we caught up with Patrick Dunnigan as the parade started. We catch him on the back end. Patrick, you've just finished uh, the parade route. Tell me how you're feeling now. Steve, that was exhilarating. <laughs> that was really awesome. You know, you were marching. Exhilarating is the right word. It was great. It was uh, very emotional for me. First, to see my firm sign, then to see uh, my firm all gathered outside, uh, hundreds of people come out to support the parade. Marching behind my alma mater's pipe bands was particularly emotional for me that they would The law school was all here, Seton Hall Law School. And the law school was here, and, and the Iona College pipe band led me down the route. That's your alma mater, right, from undergraduate school. Graduate, right, and I have, I've got the most parade aides ever uh, because I couldn't pick or choose between my friends like you. I wanted to have them all part of this special day, and then also to watch my kids and my wife march behind me for that short period of time when they when they were warm enough to do that. Really just awesome, awesome. I'm so, so excited for everybody involved in the- It's emotional, isn't it? Extraordinarily emotional. So it's just it's just great. It's such an honor to be designated the, the Grand Marshal of a St. Patrick's Day parade. Growing up as an Irish American, celebrating St. Patrick's Day every year. It's my mom's birthday, my mom, Patricia, corned beef and cabbage and boiled potatoes. And my dad, who left us 10 years ago, would be belting out Danny boy and when Irish eyes are smiling and I'm thinking of him today of course uh, so it's just it's just a really special day if you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion email us at info at caucusnj.org visit us online at oneonone.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato PhD Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. I'm joined by Dr. John Matzinger, who is the Vice President, System Chief Medical Officer at Virtua. Doctor, we are here at the CHOP at Virtua Pediatric Diagnostic Imaging Center. Long name, big significance. What exactly does it signify? Really, it signifies changing how we deliver care to our community. Um, previously, you really had to travel to Philadelphia to receive this level of care especially with on the diagnostic imaging side for children. This center allows us to provide that care to people in our own community with having, without having making them travel. 
Uh, we really we use all the expertise that CHOP has developed over the By the way, years. you keep talking about CHOP. We should make it clear that CHOP Children's is... Ho Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Pretty well known. Pretty well known. Good right. partner. A great partner. And they've been a great partner to Virtua over the last couple of years, and we really have been able to transition and really raise the bar on how we deliver care. It's interesting. You talk about uh, delivering care where people are. Mm -hmm. As opposed to what? As opposed to having to travel, whether that be to Philadelphia, New York City, or somewhere else, a further destination, with that traveling comes a lot of expense, a lot of time, and a lot of stress. And this really lowers that for the family and for the children. One of the pieces that's interesting mm -hmm. as I was getting ready for the interview, one of the areas in pediatric diagnostic imaging, by the way, describe what it is, and then I want to talk about pediatric sedation, which is a, a part of that larger equation. Pediatric diagnostic imaging is? Radiologic services provided to children. So in this case, we have the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia's radiologists actually reading all the images for CAT scans, MRIs, x-rays in this center, ultrasounds. So these are really world-class experts, fully trained in pediatric imaging. Okay. Now, the sedation piece of it, mm -hmm. what is it and why could that potentially be really important? Okay, that really differentiates this unit to a whole nother level. And this was only really provided at CHOP downtown and I believe one of their satellite uh, facilities in Pennsylvania. And what changes everything is the people we have working here. We have children life specialists, which are experts in child development, as well as pediatric sedation specialists and our nursing staff are all focused around the child and the family. And what these people do is really work the family and the children through the procedure. So our child life specialist will work to uh, lower stress on the child and the family. If sedation is necessary, we have our sedation specialists. And really with the goal of when sedation is necessary, providing it safely and, the, and less is best. Mm. What goes on for these kids? Well, what goes on for the kids is this is scary. I mean, this isn't the playground. Look at it, there's, there's a lot of lights, there's people moving around, there's alarms. It's really trying to get them comfortable and at the best you can, understanding the test they're going to get. Try to relieve the fear. But even, maybe even a little more scarier is for the parent. It's the unknown of what your child's going through. And that's really what differentiates, differentiates this unit, is the work of the entire family. I mean, I'm a father of two girls, and I'd rather go for any procedure on myself mm. than have them go through any procedure. So it's really trying to get that touch and that humanity around it. And so, really, so hold on, it's not just the clinical side, is what no, you're saying? No, not at all. It's really around the whole person. Talk to us about, um, it's interesting, as we were doing the research for the segment, mm -hmm. you begin to realize that there, there are, this particular approach, this model for doing this, it's not all over the place, right? No. You're getting folks from? We're getting folks, obviously, from the southern New Jersey market, but we're starting to see people from central New Jersey, northern New Jersey come down. And because CHOP has been so successful in their own community in Pennsylvania, th you know, there's obviously always a wait time. So we are starting to see some of those people who need the testing a little bit quicker. But we are starting to see a bigger pull and a bigger community drive to get the imaging done. When it comes to this whole question of, you know, this be well, get well, stay well that you, you talk about a lot, mm -hmm. it's a slogan. What does it actually mean when it, particularly when you're dealing with kids? Well, you're right. It, it's a slogan. For us, it's not a slogan. It's our mission. And what we're, our mission is to be well, keep the community whole, keep them moving forward, keep everybody on the right path to health, get well. For pe you know, we are an, an aging community in general. We have, we're a community with a lot of comorbidities, obesity, diabetes. It's really changing how people think, how people eat, how people exercise, how people act, changing how they live their life. And then stay well. Once you get them there, keep them there. Or if they're there, prevent them from going down the wrong path. And really, this entire building and our other health and wellness centers are built around health and wellness. As, a, as an organization, we've been hospital focused, mm. but we're transitioning away from that. We're more community focused, outpatient focused, and getting our community healthy. Yeah, it's so interesting. You say we're hospital focused, and then you say we want to move away from that, as if that's a bad thing. Well, I think the hospital is a good thing when you're sick and you have to be treated. But overall, we want to prevent you from ever being in the hospital. We'll never put ourselves out of business. Somebody's always going to need hospital care. But it's people, some people are in the hospital every single month for chronic conditions. That's, that's inappropriate. That's not good care. We need to do a better job on the outpatient side. But, Doctor, isn't it also fair to say that the government, that the laws, that health care reform, 
that January 2014, the implementation mm -hmm. of what many call uh, Obamacare, uh, the Accountable Care Act, is saying that's what you have to do. They're absolutely, they're starting to put the focus on quality and prevention. Um, I can and not coming back to the hospital. And not coming back to the hospital. I have to be honest, we looked at this three, five years ago, and we really saw that that's where healthcare should be. And that's why we made a huge investment in primary care physicians, really bolstering that market. We saw in southern New Jersey, primary care physicians exiting. They, the reimbursements were bad, the hours were long, and it just wasn't worth it to them. And we, we knew that we had a focus there. Because without our primary care physicians, who, mm -hmm. who will take care of these patients? Mm -hmm looking at our nurse practitioners, our physician assistants, and really building a medical community. Well, it is a challenge every day, and uh, everyone focus on, focuses on January in 2014 as if, you know, uh, a switch gets turned and all of a sudden, hey, that's when the national health care reform kicks in. But as you said, uh, clinicians and hospitals all across the state, all across this nation are working on it every day. So I want to thank you, doctor, for sharing what's going on here. We thank appreciate you. it. Thanks for joining Welcome. us. Welcome. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Investors Bank, the Russell Berry Foundation, Fedway Associates, Inc., New Jersey State Nurses Association, PSE and G committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and banking under the principle of stewardship. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger and NJ.com, Everything Jersey, and by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. For 17 years, the Russell Berry Foundation has recognized unsung heroes in New Jersey who have done extraordinary things for others. If you know a New Jersey resident whose selfless or heroic actions make them worthy of recognition, you can nominate them to receive the Russell Berry Making a Difference Award. With annual cash prizes of up to $50,000, this award can make a significant difference for a very deserving person. Nominations are accepted online.